Please begin, Maharaj. Om Asato Ma Sadgamaya Tamaso Ma Jyoti Rgamaya Mrityor Ma Mritam Gamaya Avir, avir, maedhi Rudra, yate, dakshinang, mukam Te, namam, pahinityam Om, lead us from the unreal to the real Lead us from darkness unto light. Lead us from death to immortality. Reach us through and through ourself and evermore protect us from ignorance by thy sweet compassionate face. The title today is Teachers of Vedanta and the particular teacher we are referring to is Swami Trigunatita Ananda who was sent by Swami Vivekananda to uh, replace Swami Turiyananda in uh, 1903, at the beginning of 1903, he arrived in San Francisco. Swami Vivekananda had passed away uh, in uh, July 1902, but before he had passed away, he had asked that Swami Trigunatita should uh, take the place of Swami Turiyananda in San Francisco. Swami Turiyananda was not well and was returning to India. So, on, in early January 1903, Swami Trigunatita came to San Francisco to start this work. And though Swami Turiyananda, who preceded him, had uh, concentrated his attention on the establishment of this retreat at Shanti Ashrama in the San Antonio Valley, uh, east of San Jose, uh, that land having been given to the to Swami Vivekananda for the purposes of starting a spiritual retreat. Uh, Swami Turiyananda had concentrated his attention on the Shanti Ashrama. He had lectured in San Francisco also, but uh, his main attention had actually been on the Ashrama in the, uh, near San Jose. So when Swami Trigunatita came, he felt that though uh, he was greatly impressed by the work that had been done uh, to mold devotees to spiritual life at the Shanti Ashrama, he felt that the important uh, emphasis of the work should be in the city, in San Francisco itself. And uh, so, what is it that, that the society, what is it that he came to serve? What is, what was available at that time? What had been developed by the time he came to San Francisco? Uh, on April 14th, 1900, the Vedanta class, or 
it was to assume various names. Oh, the following few years, the Vedanta class was organized after one of Swami Vivekananda's lectures. Swami Vivekananda had come to San Francisco in February 1900, and he lectured in the Bay Area until uh, the beginning of June. Uh, he also spent two weeks uh, just before leaving this area at uh, Samuel Taylor State Park in Marin County camping under the redwoods with a small group of students. And uh, those uh, students who, uh, whom he was leaving behind since he had decided to return to New York and then to eventually head back to India, he, dis he told them that he would send them Swami to Riyananda who had, he said, who lived what he himself had taught. Actually, he was sending the Swami here to, to live with the disciple Swamiji. He had been here mainly as a lecturer to introduce Vedanta to audiences in San Francisco and the Bay Area. Now he wanted a permanent organization to be formed where students could be instructed by precept and example to actually live that spiritual life so that the realization of God, the realization of spiritual truths would not be something just for the books, something that you could read up on that such and such in the past had realized God. It was to be a uh, a prescription for how one could in these days also achieve high spiritual understanding and spiritual realization. So uh, uh, this uh, experiment at Shanti Ashrama was the first uh, after Swami Vivekananda had left was the first activity undertaken by the new, uh, the fledgling Vedanta society. But after the, when Swami Trigunathita came, the third monk of the Ramakrishna order to come to San Francisco, he felt that the emphasis should be on the teaching and the uh, study of Vedanta in San Francisco itself. So, what were the things that he did? Actually, Swami Trigunatita was a very heroic soul, and uh, that heroism manifested itself in a number of different ways. Uh, one of the uh, more spectacular ways was that he had, con he had uh, decided and actually made it his great yearning to visit the holy places in the high Himalayas, actually in Tibet, uh, Manasarovar, is and uh, Mount Kailas are extremely revered ancient holy places situated in Tibet uh, and one has to cross the very high mountains uh, at an altitude possibly the passes were at an altitude of around 18,000 17,000 feet in which the very movement became extremely difficult. Uh, it was said that the area was uh, filled with a poison that uh, would uh, affect anyone who traveled to that area. That poison, of course, was not a poison. It was uh, a lack of oxygen at these high elevations of 
16,000, 17,000 feet. And so that uh, travel in those areas was extremely dangerous and extremely challenging. But Swami Trigunatita with tremendous uh, intensity to visit uh, Mount Kailash and Manas, the Manasarovar in Tibet, he undertook this pilgrimage with no previous training or preparation, just by his own eagerness. And he wrote about it in a series of articles which were later published in the, uh, one of the newspapers, His Adventures in Tibet. But the reason I, I'm mentioning it here, it shows the quality of his character. That uh, the, the fact that something was difficult uh, was only a challenge to him. It was not something that would discourage him in the least. If it was impossible or thought to be impossible, that was even a more uh, worthwhile challenge. So he determined to walk to this area to climb these high mountains and uh, to reach the interior of Tibet. Now, he, he wrote the reminiscences of this journey up to a certain point, but uh, it's not clear that he actually did get to the to his destination, but he did reach the interior of Tibet and uh, was, uh, I mean, after enormous hardships, unbelievable hardships, uh, but his intensity his, was so great that it carried him through all these difficulties. Now, that is the reason for mentioning it here, because he was coming to a country uh, with which he had no experience, but, and he was trying to mold the spiritual lives of the people who would come to him, the members of this Vedanta society, uh, and uh, they themselves had no idea, just like his the Swami's trip to Tibet, uh, he had no idea what enormous uh, difficulties he would f be facing in this journey into these extremely, uh, r into this e uh, extreme area of uh, tremendous deprivation, tremendous cold and uh, in the same way, he had no idea what he would be facing when he came to this country. That these people who had been charmed by Swami Vivekananda's lectures, who had be, uh, gathered around Swami Turiyananda when he had come, uh, entranced by the beauty that these two Swamis were uh, exhibiting in their own being, in their own personality, made them eager to themselves uh, practice the teachings that would enable them to also attain these uh, high uh, you know, states of living, states of understanding. So, but the, the, the people here did not know. It is like Swami Trigunatita before he went to the Himalayas. He did not know anything about what he would face. And so uh, when he came to San Francisco, he had no idea of what he would face here, what uh, the people were like, what they were what preparations they had for that spiritual experiment that it was going to be his uh, responsibility to lead them on. So he came like this uh, on, I think, January 3rd, 1903, he arrived, and immediately there were a few devotees 
uh, to welcome him and he stayed with one such family for some time uh, and uh, to assess the situation, to assess what his field of work here would be. Now, we can begin by mentioning the various things that he f founded, the various work that he did, the results that he was able to achieve here. And uh, then we can go into some of the methods of his teaching, some of the uh, techniques that he used in order to uh, bring these eager students to spiritual life because it isn't the desire. You, you see in front of you uh, an example of a person who has uh, realized, you know, to the depths of spiritual realization as these direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna had. Uh, and so naturally you feel this is extremely attractive and uh, you feel greatly eager to try to yourself reach those realms of experience. But you have absolutely no idea of the terrain, of the route that would have to be crossed in order to do that. And the route is really an internal one. It's, an in, it's not a journey through the exterior, it's a journey through the interior of one's own mind and one's own uh, tendencies which have been inherited from innumerable times in the past, innumerable lifetimes in the past, because as an integral part of this uh, Vedanta philosophy is the idea that it just did not, these, our present condition is not determined accidentally and it's not determined by the few years of our youth and of our, uh, and of, of, of of the beginning of this life, the state that we are in and the conditions of our life, all these are greatly influenced by the fact that we have been around before. If you take the theory of reincarnation away, then it is very difficult to explain very much at all about uh, our present condition and what we can do about it. But the theory of reincarnation, which is fully explained in certain texts such as the Bhagavad Gita, makes it quite clear that we are the makers of our own destiny. And it is through our own hand that all of these things that we are experiencing in this present life. Uh, it's through our own doing that uh, the groundwork for this was laid. The details uh, may differ, but the groundwork was laid in our own past. And so uh, the building, the, the, the spiritual teacher has to build not only a strong attitude in this life, he has to be cognizant of the fact that uh, a lot of this comes from the past and so the method of teaching has to be adapted to that idea. So going back to the Swami who came, when he came in uh, 1903, he first started lecturing in uh, the apartment of one uh, devotee family who, with whom he was staying and lectures and classes were carried on there for some time and also lectures were given in the uh, in, in a central hall in San Francisco and as Swami Vivekananda indeed had also done and so the uh, necessity was felt 
that in order to, for this movement to grow and Swami Trigunati there, not the slightest doubt that it would grow because he felt the power of Sri Ramakrishna, the power of Swami Vivekananda uh, behind it and that this was the uh, this was something which was seen to be an extremely important uh, aspect of the teaching in uh, the United States that it was to be uh, a place where the ancient truths that had been for thousands of years the property of the Indian tradition, that these truths, although they had made their way indirectly in certain respects, uh, it, it was to be a direct teaching that uh, was intended that those truths were supposed to come to light in the modern West. And for that to happen, there had to be a place where this teaching could be imparted and which could be a center for the dissemination of this ancient wisdom, that uh, the wisdom being thousands of years old was now going to be in a more formal way transmitted to the West. Informally, it had been transmitted through translations of the Bhagavad Gita, translations of the Upanishads, uh, through uh, other languages and finally into English, uh, so that the, uh, the transcendentalists on the East Coast uh, had uh, studied some of these scriptures. Anyway, this teaching, though it was not at all, uh, though it had been introduced in the East Coast, was, was not at all known here in the, in the West. So this was going to be uh, Swami Trigunatita when he came uh, and uh, trying to build on the work of Swami Vivekananda and Swami Turiyananda he realized it must have a, a strong foundation in a physical sense. It must have a temple, it must have a, a, a steady central place. So he determined to build this uh, temple and it was going to be the first Hindu temple in the West. There would not have been any other but the he was going to play, be the teaching center of Vedanta, of Hinduism in the West. Um, and so in 1905, he uh, and the society acquired a plot of land and within a few months actually the construction took a very short time compared to uh, some of the construction projects we have nowadays. And by, uh, in January 1906, he was able to uh, dedicate this temple. But uh, typically for him, he, he did not hide his light under a bushel. He, he made the temple a spectacular uh, creation which would attract attention. He uh, thought of it as a combination of a Hindu temple and it could also be in some, uh, you know, a sense, a place of worship for other uh, spiritual uh, faiths also, but it was basically centrally, what the main emphasis would be on this, the Hindu tradition but it would also be a place where that tradition would be presented in the modern context. And using modern, uh, you know, facilities. So one of the first things he did was to establish a printing press, uh, which in those days meant that you actually had to compose everything letter by letter, uh, manually there might have been ways of printing more uh, efficiently than that but the pictures that we have of that early 
printing establishment seemed to indicate that letter by letter you had to uh, compose it by hand. Uh, and uh, also he published some books. Uh, so it was a place where not only would there be lectures and talks, it was a place where uh, also the printed word would be uh, spread. Uh, then other f uh, features, uh, this this building, building would be used for other aspects of the religious mission. One of them is that there are certain people who are willing and able to follow uh, spiritual life exclusively. So uh, these would be called monks and nuns, and so one of his uh, major efforts was to provide the conditions where a monastery and a convent could be established. And eventually he did that. Uh, he had, as a matter of fact, the original building included just two floors, but uh, he had decided that he, in order to make it a more uh, visible center of teaching, uh, he would invite the uh, president of the Ramakrishna order in India to come and uh, lead the teaching in America, at least for some time, to give it additional impetus. The, the uh, president of the order at that time was Swami Brahmananda, who was uh, especially uh, fun, who actually Sri Ramakrishna considered as his as his spiritual son. Uh, the uh, tremendously respected monk Swami Vivekananda was Sri Ramakrishna's prime messenger, carrier of his message, but uh, especially after Swami Vivekananda's passing away, Swami Brahmananda became the uh, head and inspiration for the whole order. So Swami Trigunati did actually in his, in his enthusiasm to act, build uh, suitable uh, quarters for such a person, such an exalted personage to come. He uh, enlarged the temple, which had only two floors. He had enlarged it with a third floor, which would be an apartment for the uh, head of the order, Swami Brahmananda. Uh, and, uh, but then uh, when uh, Swami Brahmananda sent final word that he could not come because the uh, work in India was demanding his attention, Swami Trigunadita decided that the best way to make use of this uh, additional floor that he had built on the, or had, had built on the temple was to establish a monastery there. And uh, he, his uh, enthusiasm was so contagious and uh, his teaching was so, uh, in a sense, so spectacular that it attracted people who wanted to devote themselves exclusively to this life. Uh, the life of the spiritual aspirant, the life of the monk, totally dedicated to the work of the order, the work of spreading the, the uh, message of Vedanta, the work of uh, elevating oneself by all one's possible effort and means to achieve, try to achieve in this life at least some of these realizations that are talked of in the scriptures. So, uh, this Swami Trigunatita established in this way the first monastery uh, of the Hindu, this Hindu order outside India. After some years also, he, uh, some uh, devoted women disciples wanted to uh, establish a convent that would allow women that same monastic opportunity. 
And that was indeed established. A building across the street or diagonally across the street from the temple was chosen. What was available, one floor of that building at least was available and a convent was established. So these were uh, tremendous departures, new uh, things that were being uh, developed by Swami Trigunatita at that time. In addition to that, realizing the importance of the, this country retreat at Shanti Ashrama, he, uh, especially in the year 1910, he uh, greatly expanded the facilities there. Uh, it was, but it was done on a strictly spiritual basis in which uh, you know, certain spiritual values are constantly emphasized. There was one row of cabins which was used by the men. There was another row of cabins uh, across the valley on another hillside to be used by the women and uh, you know all special facilities were uh, created in the uh, dining area there were special facilities and so forth so he uh, Swami Trigunanti uh, greatly expanded the uh, teaching uh, in this way by he would hold month long retreats at uh, Shanti Ashrama once, at least once a year. Uh, not actually, not every year, but he did uh, whenever it was possible. And he developed the, uh, that uh, property also with uh, uh, a number of cabins, very simple, very rusty cabins, but very uh, adequate and solid. And uh, in that way, he also, and, and then in addition to that, there were some gardens. He established some uh, gardens where so some vegetables could be grown. So the idea of getting water was very difficult. So he had uh, tried to dig wells, had hand dug wells, and eventually they did find a, uh, sources of water. He had a windmill brought in to pump the water out of the wells and to uh, fill a, a tank that was uh, put on uh, on posts and uh, at some elevation and water from that tank would then flow to the uh, to the cabins down below. So, uh, in so many ways, he tried to uh, expand the work in, tr in a number of different directions. So, in, in also another, another new departure, he decided that uh, a country retreat would be highly desirable, a place where people would not be submitted to the normal pressures and needs of city life, where they would be able to spend their time more in spiritual contemplation. And uh, not only contemplation, but also work dedicated to, uh, for the realization of oneself and for the welfare of others. That work would be, in this case, uh, cultivation of uh, of land for the raising of uh, food uh, crops uh, and for providing ways of uh, you know, of help in various means that there would be also a temple there which would serve as the central spiritual headquarters anyway such a retreat he uh, envisioned and he found a property in uh, Concord across the bay from San Francisco which actually it was a walnut grove or walnut orchard and so he thought that these walnuts would provide a source of income for that property. 
in other words, he had a, he had an all-around vision. He was himself an all-around person, uh, totally devoted to the spirit, to spiritual life, spiritual culture, and to imparting that to others. And so all these actions were meant to uh, to support this effort. And uh, actually, it was all extremely, uh, you know, these were all the extreme forerunners of what happened later in uh, uh, a convent was indeed formed and is still established. And uh, a monastery was, uh, was uh, formed and is established. Those, those uh, were permanent uh, fixtures that uh, were very and have always been extraordinarily uh, s necessary and beneficial for the society to function for the for the Vedanta work to continue uh, and also uh, a retreat we have now established a retreat in Olima uh, on the on the basis you know in many respects not exactly what was done at Concord by Swami Trigunatita, but he pioneered it. He was the pioneer in all these areas, a man of tremendous forethought and tremendous enthusiasm and total dedication to establishing this, this work. So these are some of the, uh, you know, some of the salient features of his, uh, ministry here uh, but there's one factor also that was a little bit unusual but it was again in uh, in accordance with his uh, great vision that is when the, the 1908 he envisioned the expansion of the temple that had been built in 196 uh, not only because he wanted to build an apartment for what he hoped would be a visit from the president of the order, but also because there was, in 1915, there was a plan to have this Panama Pacific Exposition, which would take place in the Marina Green which is just a few blocks away from the location of the temple that Swami Trigunatita had built. And uh, that uh, Panama Pacific Exposition was uh, projected to be a tremendous uh, <coughs> attraction for huge crowds of visitors on the order of, you could say, the uh, the Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893 that Swami Vivekananda had attended and had been so conspicuous a figure at. Uh, so uh, such a similar uh, event of the same order was being planned for 1915 uh, and uh, so and that event would be essentially almost within sight of the temple or very, not very far away. The Marina Green is just a few blocks away from where the temple is. So the, uh, to make the temple, the building itself, an example of the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna, that was a very attractive uh, feature. And the, uh, one of the main uh, teachings for the for a worldwide significance of Sri Ramakrishna was the harmony of religions. One of his main uh, one of his main sayings, the main uh, ideas was as many pa paths, as many faiths, so many paths. In other words, whatever faith a, a person uses to realize spiritual uh, depth is a path to that depth, is a path to God. 
the, all, the, the goal of all paths is that infinite realization, that infinite reality, which is called by different names, by different people. So one of the major statements in this respect is in the, in the Rig Veda, probably the most ancient spiritual scripture in Hinduism, and possibly in the whole of human existence, is uh, in this Rig Veda, Ekam Sat Vipra Bahudhavadanti. That idea is really encapsulates in a very short phrase uh, the one of the main uh, teachings of Sri Ramakrishna, one of the main messages of spirituality in these times, one of the main necessities of spiritual life in these times. Ekam Sat. Eka means one. Sat is that which exists. Now that is a very profound idea. That which exists is only one. They are not two. Our basic philosophy in this uh, Vedantic uh, tradition that has come to the West. The basic philosophy is the philosophy of Vedanta. Vedanta is the philosophy of the end of the Vedas. That means the concluding portion of the Vedas, which means the Upanishads. And the basic message of the Upanishads, which was phrased even earlier, much earlier in the Rig Veda, is that this, that which exists is one, sat is one. There's only one existence. Ekam sat, there's only one existence. There's only one ultimate reality. It appears in so many ways, but at heart, at the basis of it, that upon which it stands, is one reality. So, in other words, that which we see all around us is constantly changing. It comes, it develops, it decays, it disappears. So many things in life are like that. The body comes and develops and eventually it disappears. All plants, all uh, Things that we see around us, they were not there long time past, now they are there. After some time, they will uh, dis disintegrate and disappear. So this, the world of our experience is made up of that which changes. But that is underlaid. This is the great, I mean, that is obvious to everyone, that the world of experience is a changing world. In fact, we. We like that, we, we want that change. We've gotten not only accustomed to it, we are, we're eager for it. It's a, it's a, it has become part of our nature to want, to expect, to desire, to hope for, to anticipate change. But we have found that nothing, none of the changes ever brings us complete satisfaction. All the changes seem to suggest that it should keep on changing. We never get a com we never get satiated with change. We never reach any end. We keep on changing from one thing to another. So Vedanta is the expression of the ultimate reality that is very difficult to express, if not impossible to actually express but it is indicated by the ancient sages and has been verified through thousands of years in between repeatedly, ekam sat, that sat, that which exists, is one. There is no multiplicity here. Neha nana stikinchana is from the Kato Upanishad. There is no multiplicity here. So what is it that is here? That is what spiritual life is trying to express. There is, at the heart of everything that changes, 
there is a reality which has never come into existence and therefore it can never disappear. It is not subject to any change. At the heart of everything that changes, there is a reality that does not change, cannot change, has never changed, will never change, is the totality of basis for everything that changes. So when we talk about our basic human urge towards spiritual realization, is the realization, is the, is the strong urge within each one of us to try to find something which is eternally satisfying, eternally uh, satisfactory and not subject to coming and going. Otherwise, so many things are very satisfactory for a time and eventually they disappear. Our lives are like that. We may, our life may be very satisfactory, but everyone knows it's there for some time and then it will disappear. So the, the cry of the human soul is for something which does not disappear, something which is eternally satisfying, eternally inspiring, eternally beautiful, eternally full of grace and love and joy. And so this is the basic message of Vedanta. Ekam sat vipra bahuddha vedanti. Now, this is what is emphasized, what Swami Trigunatita in his brilliance emphasized in the construction of this temple. On this temple, it was not the original temple, was two floors, two stories, and one tower. In 1908, when he re built the temple, or he added to the temple another floor, but above that floor he put a very significant factor. He put a number of additional towers. Originally it had one tower, which was modeled after some of the ancient temples of Bengal. But he put additional towers and the idea of the additional towers is that each tower represents a different aspect of religion uh, and of different religions. So one tower is a model of the Taj Mahal. The, uh, it's a very small tower, but it is built uh, uh, in that way, in that same style. So uh, it is a, a Muslim symbol. And then there's a Christian symbol also. There's one tower that is actually a, a uh, it's built like a European castle tower with a crenellated uh, edge around it uh, to look like a medieval castle. So one can wonder why should this be representing Christianity? But in, in those days, the exact reason for it, we don't know for sure. But we know that there are churches that are built like that. With There's one church here, I think it's on uh, Bush and uh, Franklin, I think, or Bush and Goff. Anyway, there's one church which ha has these, this crenellated uh, tower and looking like a castle tower. And that church was built, was finished, I think, in 1896 or something. So it, it was the Swami Trigunatita who designed all this, because that tower is not very far from our temple. Uh, that church is not very far from our temple. So, I mean, as a pure speculation, we say it is quite conceivable he the Swami thought this would be a possible sy symbol of Christianity. Also, if, if uh, there's a palace which was built at Avignon in France, uh, there was a time when there were two popes actually, one pope in Rome and one pope in Avignon in the south of France. And the palace of the popes in Avignon had these crenellated towers also. So anyway, whatever the case may be, the uh, original the, the idea that is a, taken to be a symbol of a Christian place of worship. 
So we have a symbol of different religious places. The other towers, one is the uh, is a, a miniature of the uh, towers at uh, the most uh, vi uh, famous temple of Shiva in Varanasi. Shiva being one of the most uh, popular Hindu aspects of divinity, worshipped especially in the city of Varanasi, which is Banaras. And the, the many domes, the multiple domes of that tower are uh, actually, a, you could say, almost a reproduction of what is on that temple in uh, Varanasi. Then also there's another temple uh, tower which is a reproduction of a temple at the at Dakshineshwar where the master, the teacher of uh, Swami uh, Trigunatita uh, was living for decades and where the Swami Trigunatita himself and his brother disciples came and learned of spirituality. So that was one of the other towers. Like that, the uh, different spiritual traditions are represented in this building in a very spectacular way. And not only that, Swami Trigunatita did not hide his light under a bushel. He had lights all over the building. In those days, electric lights were were fairly new. They they had not been around for that long. But he put these electric lights around the whole building so to uh, beautifully and brilliantly illuminated. And uh, so the uh, you know this was another of his. Uh, another of his uh, great uh, invention. But the idea is that this uh, would be visible to the thousands of people who were expected to come to the uh, Colombian exposi Exposition, the, uh, that was going to be, uh, sorry, the uh, Panama Pacific Exposition, Exposition that was supposed to be happening in 1915, just a few years later. So this would be a tremendous uh, attraction, a tremendous message of unity, unity and diversity, that all these religions on the same building mean that the, the, all these religions in the same universe, the same world, can work together for unity. Well, there are many more things to be said about Swami Trigunatita, his inspiration, his methods of teaching, his uh, how he guided students. It, he was really an extremely innovative, extremely brilliant uh, teacher. And I've just uh, barely been able in this time to touch upon it. But anyway, if in the, within the next few minutes, if you have any questions to ask, that'll be nice. We can talk about it briefly, at least. If you don't say anything, then I threaten to keep on talking for <laughs> Okay, I'll say something. Okay. It's one with you guys. But go ahead, Bobby. I hope, you'll, I hope you'll fulfill that thread. I hope you'll fulfill the thread because I'm quite curious to hear how uh, Swami Tribunadita uh, um what his what his instructional techniques were like. His instructional techniques were uh, really quite uh, amazing in many ways. Uh, he was. In a sense, he had experienced the reality of things, the truths. The truths that he was teaching were matters of his own experience in a very powerful way uh, because he was a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, who by many is considered uh, an incarnation of that divine principle itself, whose teaching was uh, 
extremely, uh, you know, specific and extremely uh, devoted to fully, as fully as possible as one could ex expect, fully uh, reveal the nature of God in, in as, as far as it can be done in words to inspire people to the spiritual life. And uh, so his, his methods of teaching in a way were, you could say, quite dictatorial. I mean, in the sense that he, he was the teacher and he knew what he was talking about. I mean, it is not, it is not a matter of uh, one opinion versus another opinion. I mean, if you attend a class in, uh, say, in physics, uh, you can uh, argue with the teacher and say, well, I don't know, you're being so dictatorial about saying these uh, protons, neutrons, electrons exist, uh, these quarks exist, these, uh, all these strange things exist, but uh, you can't show me any proof of it. You have never seen a proton, neutron, electron. You may have seen certain paths that you interpret to be that, these are all your interpretations. You haven't seen any of it. You know, how am I, why should I believe you? You know, you have to do more than that. No, Swami Tigunatita had experienced what he was talking about. And so when he said you have to uh, do this, you have to meditate, you have to, uh, you cannot allow, his main, uh, fun, his main teaching was to subdue the ego. The ego, I know this, I can do this, I want this, I remember this, I, 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 you see. This is our life and it's just fine. In, in one sense you want to strengthen that ego so that you're able to lead a more uh, a fuller life. But for a spiritual uh, training, the ego which emphasizes the finite and the difference between one thing between you and everybody else stands in the way. What you want to realize is that there is only one reality, God alone exists, and you are saying, I exist, and then we'll talk about the truth about where, whether God exists or not. So it's, it's a very difficult thing for a spiritual teacher to try to make that point. So Swami Trigunatita was not at all gentle in this. He was quite uh, specific that certain things had to be done and uh, certain, there had to be a, an obedience uh, uh, to the spiritual guide. If you, accept, if you accepted him as a spiritual guide, you had to be willing to accept what he says. If you tell your physics teacher, well, I don't believe all this, this is ridiculous. He will say, well, you know, then you go find somebody else to teach you. <laughs> This is, in other words, religion is a science, just like ordinary science. So that type of dictatorial, uh, you know, approach is in the very nature of the subject. I just want to. Mm. You see, I've stunned them all, so they have no more questions whatsoever. I got a question, Swamiji. Okay. <clears throat> this is a kind of philosophical question about uh, Vedanta. <clears throat> and um, the way I understand it is that uh, there's one existence, uh, which is Brahman, and that this world emanates or emerges from that one existence. So my question is, how could this world of duality, which we live in, possibly emerge from a non-dual substance, Brahman? How can duality arise from non-duality? Oh, that's a wonderful question. The answer is it doesn't. <laughs> it does not. It does not arise at all. We see it as arising. We see these things appearing. We see, we see the many. 
And we say, how can the many arise from the one? If the one is the reality, why is it that I on, that I only see the many? The 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 point is, we're we're thinking we see the many, but we're calling it the many. But all we're seeing is really the one. In other words, the the idea is. Uh, just that same se sentence, ekam sat, truth is one, vipra, that means wise people speak of it in different ways. But what people speak about, what people discuss, what you see, the differences that you see around you are true and actual on the surface. This, they are these differences. But that is only on the surface, at the heart of things it is all one. It is like you're seeing uh, a, a set of sculptures. One sculpture is of a, you know, of a man, and other sculptures of a, a, a house or a, you know something. Different sculptures are there. There's a man sitting on a horse or something. All these uh, things are there. Made uh, sculptures are made in so many different shapes. But what is what are these sculptures really speaking? It's only that material out of which they're made is the same. They're all either clay or steel or whatever it is. In other words, the appearance is different, but the the essence is the same. So what we're focused on is the appearance. That's the only thing we know. This looks different from that. But is it different from that? No, it's not different from that. At the heart, only God exists. The reality that you see as, in one aspect as moving, in another aspect as non-moving, at heart it's the same. I mean, even scientifically, they, they come to that point. You know, you see all these things are different, but all you're really looking at is protons, electrons, neutrons. So the scientist tells you this, you know, all of these things are really protons, electrons, neutrons. That's all it is. There isn't anything else. Well, if you increase the energy, then you can tell there are mesons and, uh, and the quarks and uh, all sorts of things are there. But the, in essence, every material you're looking at is made up of only protons, electrons, neutrons. And nobody questions that. Nobody says, oh, that's ridiculous. Everybody says, yes, 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 these scientists have said this was so, so this must be so. Now, spiritually, we say all that you're seeing is Brahman. You're seeing the surface is different, the shape is different. But it's the essence, if you could really look into it, if like if you had an electron microscope or if you had a, a particle accelerator, you could prove that everything that you see is protons, electrons, neutrons. Never mind windows and doors and floors and people. Those are all your superimpositions. In essence, they're all protons, neutrons, electrons. In the same way we say everything looks different on the surface, the name, form, and function are different. But Satchidananda, existence, consciousness, bliss, the divine principle is the same. Sri Ramakrishna made this point. There are, here there are a number of things. Satchidananda and Nama Rupa. That means there are five things here. Satchidananda is that, that infinite consciousness, bliss, that these are different views of that spiritual principle, and nama and rupa, name and form, uh, make all the difference here. But in essence, it's only Satchidananda that's formed this way. Uh, if you've got, uh, in some uh, candy shops, you've got things made out of sugar. Or if you like marzipan, I don't know if you know what marzipan is, it's a German delicacy, it's made out of uh, almonds, and uh, but what they do is they make out of almond paste. It's an almond paste. They make little houses and, and they color them. They they with food coloring. They paint them in a certain way. So you've got all these houses and uh, animals and this and that. 
And it's wonderful, you enjoy it, and you take one of them and you eat it. It's marzipan, it's, uh, it's almond paste, it's wonderful. So this is the same thing here. This universe is just Satchitana, it's just God, it's just infinite reality. There is no multiplicity whatsoever. Neha na nasti kinchana, it says in the, uh, in the Upanishad. Neha na nasti kinchana. There is no nana, there's no multiplicity here in any sense. There is only Satchirananda, there's only God, there's only the infinite and the eternal. Is it, the, is it the reason that we don't see it that way? Is it because of Maya? Well, Maya is the, is the appearance. The appearance that we see, Maya is this appearance that we see. The fact that we see it as buildings, as houses, as people, as different things, the fact that we don't see it as Brahman, that we don't see it as Satchitananda, that we don't see it as God, that is Maya, that is the that is our inability to penetrate the appearance of it, to come to the reality, what it really is. Uh, so the thing is, if we are able to practice these spiritual disciplines, to realize, that, to see where, where is the easiest, what's the easiest place that we can first see the reality in our own hearts. So that's why meditation is there. Meditation, when we quiet the exterior, we're able to see the interior, we see able to see what the light within. If you look at a lake, for instance, Lake Tahoe is an exa a wonderful example. If you look at it, you see it as the most magnificent blue that you've ever seen on, at certain times of day. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, you see it, it, it is so attractive. But one thing is you're only seeing the surface of the lake. The mind is just like that. We are only seeing the surface of the mind and we see it as people, as things, as, as this universe. So we see the reflection from the surface of the mind, we see the reflection from the surface of Lake Tahoe and we see that beautiful blue because the wind is blowing, the wind of desire, the wind of thoughts, of ambitions, of this and that, of uh, these are all wonderful things, but they're all winds. We need ambition, we need desires, we need these things to live in this world, but don't forget they're all winds, they cause a, a, a ruffling of the surface. So when that wind stops, when the mind can achieve that quiescence, then you don't see that blue reflection of the lake at all, but you see something which you never, so the appearance disappears, but you see something that you have never seen before. You see every pebble on the bottom of the lake with pristine clarity because the water is so clear. So the same thing, this is the example of meditation. The mind becomes so quiet that all these motions are basically uh, stopped. You don't see that. You don't see that what's on the surface. But you see what's in the mind. You see what's at the heart of the mind, what's the soul, the reality, the foundation, at the, uh, the basis of everything is what you see. And this is the example that's used. When the mind becomes quiet, you see Brahman within the soul. You see Brahman within your own reality then you can understand the truth that the surface has, has all this variety, but in reality nothing exists but that spiritual entity. So I've, I've stunned them all now, they have no further question, they have <laughs> quiet oh, everyone. So that, that, I have a question. Yes, yes, uh, yes. <laughs> so, uh, Turiyananda ji left Shanti Asram, but he, she, he got a, a vision of mother getting upset because he left Shanti Asram. Now then, Trigunanti Dhananda ji came, 
but he never put that much stress on the Shanti Ashram. So, did Turiyananda ji tell Triguna Nanda ji about the vision that the mother was upset because he left uh, Shanti Ashram? Uh, we don't know whether he did or not, but ah. the thing is that uh, the mother, I mean, the story is, of course, Swami Trigunathi. I mean, Swami Turiyananda himself told that story that the the mother had appeared. That means the divine principle, the divine reality, uh, as manifested personally in a divine reality, divine being that he saw, appeared to him just like I mean, Christian saints have had visions of Christ. Uh, Saint Teresa had a vision of Christ. Saint, uh, uh, you know. So this is uh, this is quite uh, in the spiritual realm. This is not unusual. Anyway, this vision uh, Swami Turiyan on the head was that he should not leave the Shanti Ashrama. That if he left, if he stayed, it would grow into a magnificent place, and uh, he was shown what it would look like. But Swami Turiyananda said, no, Mother, let me go back and uh, consult Swamiji, because Swami Vivekananda was in India. Uh, anyway, uh, she, uh, when, he, when he gave that answer, apparently she assumed a very displeased appearance and uh, <laughs> You know, so Swami Turiyanan said, I have done wrong, but I cannot help it. No, it's, it's done. The thing is, in a way, these are sweet stories that we, you know, that we, we keep for our own inspiration. But what actually would have happened or would not have happened, nobody knows. You know, I mean, it, it is a place, the San Antonio Valley is now, now still a very deserted place. There are ranches there, it's ranch land and then the forest land and uh, Department of Fish and Game land, a very uh, uninhabited place even today. But it could very well have uh, become a very uh, successful place. <coughs> You know, so why we can't blame anybody for not <laughs> that it wasn't successful, and what would have happened to that ashrama? Who knows what would have happened? For us, the the uh, it's not the details that are important. The point is that there is a divine reality that ordains things in this world. So not only. Are we talking about Brahman and uh, and Atman and reality? But that Brahman also manifests in different ways and performs different actions. Yada yada idharmasya glanir bhavati bharata. Whenever righteousness uh, decreases and unrighteousness increases. Tadatmanam Srajamyaham, I manifest and in order to protect the wicked, in order to remove, uh, pro protect the virtuous, remove the wicked. <laughs> <laughs> like, sometimes it seems the other way, but you know, anyway, that is the idea. So this is uh, how things are manifested in this way. You cannot tell. You have these these stories of what happened in the past, and you can make speculations. But the, the essence of it is, manifestation is always like that. Everything that's, that's in this world is always like that. It is good, well, maybe. It is bad, well, maybe not. You know, so somehow these are, this is how manifestation acts. And to say, what would that Shanti Ashrama have been like if Swami Turiyananda had stayed? It's a very pleasant occupation, we can think about it, but really it doesn't lead anywhere. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you.
Om Dyao Shanti Antareksham Shanti Prithivi Shanti Apo Shanti Roshadaya Shanti Vanaspataya Shanti Vishwe Deva Shanti Brahma Shanti Sarvam Shanti Shanti Reva Shanti Sama Shanti Redhi Om Shanti 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 Om Peace is in Heaven Peace is in the sky, on the earth, and in the waters. The herbs, the plants, and the trees are full of peace. The gods are peaceful. Everything in this universe is pervaded by peace. May that infinite, universal peace enter our soul and being. Om peace, peace. Peace be unto us all. Thank you, Swamiji. Mm, okay. Very good. Thank you, Swamiji.